Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We only need one more Patreon subscriber to achieve our goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a jackhammer chatterbait or a pack of Senkos, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. You'll get access to our private Facebook group community, members only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. We only need one more, one more person to sign up and we'll have cracked our major milestone. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Uh, and today we have a really special guest. Before we get into that, I'm assuming the Kayak Fishing Expo went well. The only way that everyone asks me how I can put out three to four episodes a week is because most of them are pre-recorded, thank God. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to fish or do anything. So I'm assuming the Kayak Expo went well and the whole place didn't burn down. Um, and really to get with the whole kayaking vibe and stuff, I have on a guy that's been on the list. As you guys know, I have this big ass piece of paper here because every day I get emails and text messages of people I need to have on the show. And this individual was on the list and I'm so glad I finally got to him. Travis Myers. Travis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. How did you get into this crazy thing of fishing? Well, it's kind of uh, kind of funny because uh, neither my uh, mom or dad fished uh, where I grew up, grew up in upstate New York, and it was largely farm country. Um, and unbeknownst to me, uh, we had some terrific fishing all the uh, all around our house, and you know, from uh, the Upper Delaware River, the East and West Branch of the Delaware, and I was right between Cayuga and Oneida. Wow. And we had a Susky uh, feeder that went, you know, right through our property, literally uh, right through my mom and dad's property when I was growing up. And I just got addicted to the river thing. And, uh, you know, long story short, uh, quite honestly, I think my parents had enough of me when I was growing up where they would drop me off at my grandmother's farm to, to learn the work ethic. Uh, every summer. I, I didn't think they loved me anymore or something because, uh, you know, I'm canning and I'm haying and I'm doing all this stuff on my grandmother's farm. And um, in the evening, if we had a really good day of work, you know, what she considered a good day, uh, she would take me uh, on her property and we'd either go brook trout fishing, with, you know, in a stream that went through her property. And, and uh, quite honestly, my grandmother, I guess, taught me how to fish and it, and it was those uh those summers that i got dropped off to to learn how to bloody some hands up and uh get real itchy on the on the hay wagon and stuff so that that's where i got it, it so. new york is such a weird state because if you're not in the know you just think of manhattan brooklyn that stuff you don't think of the rest of the state and how many outdoor opportunities there are it's crazy yeah, absolutely. Uh, New York is phenomenal. Uh, upstate New York, as soon as you get outside the city, you know, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half outside the Bronx. I mean, you're in dairy farms and, uh, you know, apple orchards and it's just phenomenal country up there. Um, if they didn't have uh, winter seven months a year, uh, you know, my wife and I'd still be there, but uh, that got a little old. Um, yeah, I couldn't deal with that. <laughs> I could not deal with those winters. I can barely yeah. deal with the winters here. It, it, you know, down here is like Bermuda compared to where I grew up, right in that snow belt below Syracuse. And, uh, you know, down here is really nothing uh, at all uh, compared up there. And, uh, you know, growing up, I fished for everything it, it, that was big, that had fins uh, from brook trout to muskie. Uh, did a lot of ice fishing, did a lot of salmon fishing. Uh, everything from, uh, you know, ultralight to largemouth reservoirs to uh, going into Maine for landlocked salmon. It, 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 I was ate up with it when I was a kid. And, uh, uh, but having that river, um, you know, that went through our property, I, 
I got addicted to River Smalley's uh, at a really young age. I think I, I took my first one on a jitterbug when I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old, and it was lights out, and I was pretty much done. Um, that, that was, from there, uh, it just smallmouth fishing in general. Um, going to Quebec and Canada and all that stuff at a really young age and fishing to St. Lawrence when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, all that stuff. And, um, certainly been blessed. I've been, been all over the world, you know, uh, fishing and, um, how many farms did you, or how, how many acres did you have growing up? Oh, it's 800 like, plus, yeah, probably 800 plus. Holy crap. Okay. So yeah, it's a farm farm. I mean, I yeah, know in Northern Virginia and Western Loudon, it's like five to six acres is considered like a farm plot. So sure. damn. Right. Dairy cows or beef? Yes, sir. Yeah. Apple orchards, dairy cows. Yeah. Cornfields. That is so much freaking work. What? <laughs> What was the evolution of kayaks back then, especially up there? Because I, I really don't know where the, I guess, I know you think of Alabama as like the mecca of like tournament boat bass fishing. I, I mean, was kayak fishing and the evolution of it up there, was it kind of like nuanced? Was there always a good kayak scene up there? Um, this was, when I was growing up up there, it was well before kayaks even existed, unless you dug one out of a, you know, a birch. Uh, they didn't exist. Uh, um, er everything was, uh, this was, you know, even before inflatables and uh, everything was canoes on, on any kind of moving water or a really small John boat. Uh, some of our deeper tributaries up there, you could get away with a, you know, a small John boat. Um, you know, kind of like back in the old Fish and Facts magazine days where you had Dan Gapin and stuff on these you know, really small Minnesota rivers and everything. And, and, um, I think I bought my first boat when I was, uh, I think 14 and it was a, a 12 foot John boat. And, uh, that thing had ended up with more dents in it than, uh, you know, a, a tin can uh, by the time I got done with it. Um, but I caught so many fish out of that thing. And, uh, um, it wasn't really until, uh, probably about 98, 99 that the kayak thing started coming on and, and quite a few of us on the, uh, river, the old river smallies.com site started getting into the kayak thing from the canoes and the cataracts and, you, you know, and all that. So and when you say river smallie.com, <clears throat> was that while you were still up in New York or was that when you made the transition and came down here? It was right in between. <laughs> Um, okay. it, it, it was, uh, right about that 99, 2000 time frame. Um, and, uh, it, there were some great members on there. And of course, you know, forums are a lot different than, you know, the Facebook thing. And there was so much information, you know, passed on there with so many of the, the so-called old, old heads, you know, and everything. And, and um, for the people that were born after that point in time, could you explain to them like what you're talking about? Was this like a Tinder? Was this like an app? Or was this an old forum? Like, I think a lot of people don't appreciate like what this was. Yeah, it was uh, pretty much uh, if somebody goes on, uh, you know, like Bass Boat Central, if they go on there now, that it, it was a message board. It was very similar to that. Um, but it was just a much more intimate group where, you know, we were all just addicted to small, you know, smallmouth and um, largely from about Indiana and Ohio East. Okay. Um, Regional. Were, well, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we reached, you know, some members out West, but they, they were kind of here and there, but um you know, and we used to have uh, River Smalley, you know, get togethers and stuff where people would travel and fish together for, you know, like a week, you know, and um, it, it was good stuff. It, and uh, I was actually on that site right before my wife and I moved here to the uh, Eastern Panhandle because I very distinctly remember going to a River Smalley get together at Front Royal. And we were there for about four to five days. 
And it's kind of ironic because uh, the same route that I took, you know, from like the Martinsburg, Winchester, 81 area and everything to, to reset, you know, get together. Uh, I commuted that for 14 years going to work after we moved here. So, you know, kind of ironic that we ended up, uh, you know, buying our home here and where we ended up. So let's talk about that. Like, how did you end out of all the places you could come? Like, why did you come here? Uh, I got an offer to uh, run a at-risk uh, youth school and, uh, in Old Town, Maryland. And um, I jumped at the opportunity uh, to do that, to be the administrator at that school. And, uh, and quite honestly, we still needed to be within a, a drive of Pittsburgh because that's where all my, my wife's family was gotcha. still located. So I wanted to be around River Smalley's in the middle of nowhere um, and preferably live right on the water because uh, I always have. And that, that When I met my wife, I had a house right on uh, the Allegheny River uh, right near Franklin, Pennsylvania. Wow. And I, I've always, you know, I think every every place I've ever lived, other than being in a Marine Corps, I, I've lived on water, and I, I wanted to live on the water. And uh, um, so, essentially, we came here to be where we could be in the middle of nowhere and fish on pretty much untouched water, and uh, still be within a drive of my in laws. So, and for the people that been, don't, it's been great. I mean, it really has. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't move anywhere to, you know, for anything. I love it. And for the people that don't know, uh, well, you don't have to give up your home address, but you, so you live in the West Virginia area up near up the Upper Potomac, correct? Is that in the but the New Orleans, Paul Paul type of area? Yes, sir. Yeah. And I think that'll be a that's a fun transition because this, and we talked about this a little bit beforehand. Uh, it, that that part of the river. It's really like the New River where it's very mysterious, it's old, there's not a lot of information about it, and it's really when you get past Hancock, I think, it's, it's kind of the area, and for the new listeners, if you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or watching on YouTube, you know, I live in between Hancock and, and Berkeley Springs, basically. For some reason, they say we have a Hagerstown zip code for some god knows reason, but I can throw a rock into Pennsylvania, so I'm, I'm right there. Um, and I know that area very well, but when you get past, new, when you get past Hancock, you talk to everybody, there's just not a lot of information about that. And it's just, it's cool. It's really neat. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you, you know, I do kind of, uh, get a kick when I hear about fishing pressure and, you know, holiday weekends and, um, you know, I might see three fishermen a year. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I'm certainly blessed with uh, you know wh where we uh, where we ended up. So, what is that? So I'm pretty. That's at the split, the confluence, right? That's above the confluence of the Potomac River. Is that the South Fork of the Potomac? Yeah, it's all all right in the same general area there. You you can throw a stone between the north north branch south branch and yeah how big is that part of the river like width wise is it kind of like the south fork of the shenandoah when it comes to width yeah i would say very similar okay so it's really it's yeah. it's it's pretty tight quarters then if you're fishing it yes sir yeah that's really freaking cool like what what are you dealing with is it as dangerous as like the new river or or maybe some places up um up north or is it a pretty chill place to actually be able to float whether you're kayaking or canoeing um i would say uh probably just down river from pawpaw it gets a little hairy um i, I would uh suggest someone know what they're doing uh down there where just down river from pawpaw is uh i i I wouldn't do that solo if mm. I didn't know what I was doing. Is it is it like waterfalls and rapids? Just really? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of bony water through there, and it's got some flow to it. Gotcha. 
that's important to know. Is there like any, it looks, you know, on the map, like it's completely isolated. Like, do you just have to know somebody to be able to put in and then take out? Or is there a lot of public ramps? Uh, there's some public ramps. Um, now I should preface this with, uh, my wife and I live right on the water. So access isn't, to, oh, yeah. Uh, you, you know, I've got, um, probably 25 to 30 river miles going one way in back of the house and another 25, 30 going the other way. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I do get a kick out of, uh, you know, I like anybody else, I read stuff online and, and, um, you know, people asking about put ins and, we live in a, a day and age now where, you know, back back in the old days, it, it was a dorm atlas and a full tank of gas to find these places. And, that, that, you know, that's how we used to uh, we used to roll uh, on, you know, from point A to point B, whether or not it takes seven hours or 17 uh, was pretty much uh, a lot of. Uh, a lot of experimentation, you know, and then factor in CF, uh, uh, you know, the CFS throughout the season and everything might slow you up or speed, you know, or might speed you up. And where it's, it, it was just a lot of doing and a lot of time on the water, a lot of years. Um, no one knows, you know, ins and outs. And, you know, and other times of the year where you, you know, quite honestly, if you're floating down, you're probably at a, a disadvantage. Uh, you know, if you're walking upriver, quite honestly, in a lot of our lower water areas, uh, you, you're going to do better than you are, you know, crashing through a spot. How de how deep is these areas of, of this Potomac from like Pawpaw to the confluence? Oh, uh, there's some, there's some definite, uh, definite places in there where you want to be floating. And I know I misspoke when I said confluence, but honestly, just like from Paul Paul to Hancock. Um, Cause I sure. know like the South Fork and the North Fork of the Shenandoah, they're basically two different rivers. Like the North Fork is, is can be really shallow. You can almost wade the whole thing, you know, right. mar margin a couple of areas. But I didn't know if like this portion of the Potomac was just like deep, narrow and, and fast moving, or if it was kind of meandering. It's almost uh, it's almost a different river around each bend. Wow, That's I mean, cool. it really it, it, there's a lot of changes in it, um, and you, you you know, and you hear this a lot, but I I, I couldn't stress enough where you, you want to have some experience on a paddle, and uh, you want to be able to read water. Um, and quite honestly, uh, even a torpedo in that area it is pretty much for a lot of the year it's it's useless really yeah which cuts down, you know it cuts down on traffic as well mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of current yeah it's a lot of current and it's a lot of uh you know you got sections there where you might be uh if you're fishing upriver, you might be dragging 7,500 yards in less than a foot of water. So what so, is the... I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, compare and contrast the fishing then from that area of the Potomac compared to uh, below, hand, uh, below deep, uh, big... Uh, I can say it. I live right here. Big slack. My God. So below Big Slack, the dam there, and you get towards Shepherdstown, like compare and contrast the fishing styles then, because is it is it basically the same type of river or is it completely different in how you fish it? I think it's different. I, I think that uh, probably the best piece of advice that I could give is uh, being, able to, being able to deliver finesse baits from a distance and know what, like, be in tune with finesse tackle small lifelike offerings that you can bomb cast from a distance in gin clear water and uh kind of leave the largemouth thinking at home because of the depth because of the depth and the clarity and what the forage is uh forage tends to run small um even on big fish i mean elephants eat peanuts where i live um 
you know, I, I, I catch, uh, you know, 20 inch and up fish every year on stuff that probably most guys wouldn't throw. Um, I, th I throw a lot of finesse stuff and you better be able to make long casts and keep off those fish. It is fascinating to me when you look at like the Susquehanna, the Juliata, the size of the bait and the bait fish, and you hear everybody saying about the big glide baits for smallmouth. Right. And I've, I've had a few years and a few days on the upper Potomac at different positions. And I, we just don't have the same size bait. We really don't. And I don't right. think we have the same crayfish population because it, it's so weird that you go out there and you don't see the bottom crawling with crayfish like other rivers. Um, my area is, Ooh. um, and they are largely, uh, crayfish eaters, uh, looking down, um, one of the, one of the best pieces of advice, at least in my area, I could give somebody is know how to fish low and slow without getting wedged in rock. Do you think a crayfish population is kind of like correlates to the health of the water, like the water quality? It, it, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, I really do. Um, it, it, I mean, I know for a fact that we have at least five different species of crayfish in this area. And literally, you, you can be walking across a flat in a river and, I mean, the bottom is crawling. That's weird. Yeah, because if you go down near my area like uh where the conica jig dumps in the conica jig it's just the ground moves there's so many crayfish but right. as soon as you get to the potomac river at four locks and big slack that whole area of williamsport it's just you don't see hardly any crayfish it's just so bonkers to me right and it's got yep. because there's some kind of spill or something like that that happened yeah i, I would definitely think water quality has something to do with it hmm do they, have the flathead gotten up towards you yet? No, sir. No. no, that's good. Yeah, they're bad down here, especially at Williamsport. Yeah, that's fine that they're not here. Now, musky, that is something where I think the reason this place is so calm is it's not because people care about the smallmouth fishing. It's because there's five guys at musky fish, um, and they're trying to protect that for all it's worth. Is that... The most tourist traffic you see in the water, would you say that's mostly musky guys or is it a little bit of everybody of the people that go um, up there? No, quite honestly, I, I I really don't see a lot of fishermen up up here hmm. of any kind. Um, uh, I, I would say the area generally lacks a... Uh, it, you know, any kind of uh, measurable, intelligent fishing pressure, which is fine by me. How did you go from living there to getting the sponsors, getting the accolades? You know, you're, you've been in, in, in Fisherman Magazine. You've been on I guess, Mr. Smallmouth Crush's channel as well. Um, did you do a lot? When did you start? Did you do any kayak tournament fishing? If you did, when did that start? Um, I am not a tournament guy. I, um, my, I guess, uh, in my heart of hearts, I'm still competing against the smallmouth, and, uh, I continually year in and year out, uh, just try to get better and better every year. And, uh, um, I'm a, my absolute worst critic uh, on the water, uh, every year I try to outdo the previous year. Um, and I just work hard at it. And I, I, you know, I've been on moving water now for 40 plus years and, um, I'm just addicted to it. I, I, I love it. Um, now, you know, small town, West Virginia, middle of nowhere, uh, being on smallmouth crush and being friends with Ned Cady and, um, I don't know. Ned Katie and I really, really hit it off. I think, uh, he appreciated the fact that, um, I had a lot of respect for a lot of the old school anglers, uh, that the world has largely forgotten. Uh, your Charlie Brewers, your Billy Westmoreland's, your Dan Gapins, and, um, 
I, I've still got a lot of respect for those old school anglers that kind of paved the way for so much of the stuff that we take for granted now. Um, uh, I have been uh, urged here in recent times um, to throw my hat into the tournament thing. Um, uh, there is uh, a friend of mine that's starting up the Smalley Chasers, you know, tournaments. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he's a wonderful guy. I think he's uh, very knowledgeable. Um, time will tell. What, but, what are your apprehensions? Um, I see three or four anglers a year. And I go whenever I want to. And I have a, a very demanding day job where I, I don't know in, you know, if, uh, if given the demands of my day job and being, being on call 24 seven, given what I do, if it's advantageous for me to be, you know, 300 yards away from there, 300, you know, miles away from the house and I might get called into work. Uh, that's one. And uh, quite honestly, I think the prize money in kayak bass fishing needs to go up a little bit to tempt me a little bit more for it to be worth my time. And that's not me sounding pompous, but with all the money that you've got in lodging and gas and tackle and, and uh, you know, most of us own two or three kayaks and trailers and, uh, um, you know, the money's got to be there to be a little bit more luring as well. Um I love to teach, uh, you know, guys on the water. I, I, I do have anglers that come and fish with me uh, on a yearly basis, and I'm blessed for that. Um, I try to uh, do everything I can to, you know, make them better on the water and kind of pass down what, I, what I've learned over the years. Um, but long story short, I mean, smallmouth crush and in fishermen, and, uh, it, you know, I, I was blessed to uh, – become friends with Ned Cady and he, you know, he really, uh, he and I spoke the same language. So. Is that how you got with your sponsors? No, I had sponsors before that. Um, I've, I've, uh, over the years, uh, provided, uh, product input to some companies that, uh, suffice it to say, probably made some pretty good money off of some stuff that was in my head and it's still making them money. How did those uh, connections happen? I mean, did you, just, did you just call them out of a yellow book and then it, it happened? Or was it somebody you got to meet on the water? Was it a relationship you had for a while? Uh, probably a lot of emails and a lot of fish pictures and a lot of... Uh, you know, phone calls about, you know, maybe you should change the drop rate on this or maybe uh, hook placement on this. And, uh, you know, I had some companies that took me up on that. Um, you know, and again, I, I, I make no bones about it. I'm just a smallmouth freak that lives in the woods. It's just uh, well-traveled, and I still I love smallmouth fishing <laughs> to this day. So, um and if, uh, you know, if that's how, uh, things end up for me, I'm perfectly content with that. Um, you know, I, I, I still love doing it and I, I try to get on the water at least, uh, two, if not three days a week, even to this day. And even with the demands of my day job. So you mentioned in the article and on an interview about drop, right. Um, you know, I, I usually don't like to beat the dead horse with, with, with same topics, uh, people have covered, but, Sure. What is the importance in that when you're dealing with a shallow river? So example is near Paul Paul area, if the average depth is a, is, is waiting, let's just say waiting depth, how is drop rate affected by that compared to if you're pitching and flipping a, a one ounce jig at a dock that's 10 to 15 feet deep? Like the fall rate, it has more depth to fall versus, you know, 10 inches. Right. Um I think it's so very important to maximize, 
on the rivers, uh, you know, that I fish and the water that I fish to maximize that drop rate. And it wasn't any different than up in New York, um, you know, on the uh, on the two feeders up there that I fished on a regular basis. It was very similar water. Um, to give them the longest look that you can where something is nearly suspended, even in a foot of water, um, and tantalizing and not crashing to the bottom and making them root around on the bottom to find it. Uh, if it's within their eyesight, you, you know, and uh, you fish uh, you fish spy baits. You know, I've caught on some episodes that you like to do a real with spy baits. Once or twice. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, that is within their sight. It's mid-column upper column they're not looking down for that they're either looking straight ahead or up and they don't have to go tail down to find it and uh smallmouth being you know so largely sight feeders mm. um you know that slow drop rate is is huge and i couldn't tell you over the course of a year how many smallmouth i catch before a bait ever hits bottom and I fished really lightweight and weightless a lot. It, it is interesting to me. This is 2023 was the first year I was blessed with getting, you know, forward facing sonar and watching fish behavior. And this past winter, I was always the old school Jeff Little. You're going to take your hair jig, you throw it out there, you leave it there for 30 minutes, you move it in, you move it for 30, you know, and the bite was really slow. And then I started drifting these certain parts of the river with a Tamiki rig where you're just floating it right off the rock and to watch in 38 degree water, they are still so active when something is floating past them versus it's sitting on the bottom. It's like, it's something different in that fish's mind and how it reacts to it. It's crazy. Yeah. They have less time to inspect that of course. And it's either eat it or it's gone. And, Even uh, in the colder water though, they do that. Right, it's not like they right. just say like, Nope, I'm not going to eat that meal. It has to be on the bottom. They will have that burst of energy even in colder water, which is fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that there's uh there's always, and I kind of touched it on this in my, my last interview on another, uh, on another show, but, um, if I was content with, you know, everything I've done over the last 35, 40 years or, you know, whatever, I'm, and I'm dating myself with that, but I, I'm moving water. If I was content with what I think I know, I wouldn't get better. And I'm constantly trying to get better uh, year in and year out. Uh, some years it's an absolute complete bust. If I go off and left field, on something and you know and I, I beat my brains in on it um i go back to my tried and true um but i'm always always experimenting and which falls right in line with what you're saying i think there's a lot of old school myths um that those units are opening up uh you know and not only on river smallies but obviously elsewhere but uh, fish yeah. behavior, I think we've got a lot to learn uh, over what has been regurgitated in books for years. Yeah, that's that's the thing where with forward-facing scenario, at least I've seen his work, I will just watch stuff and not fish sometimes to see how they interact underneath eddies and stuff and how they move around. Um, and they can get so suction cupped to the bottom, it's, it's insane in this cold water. And they're big fish, too, that just disappear underneath a rock. And... I, with this time of year uh, in, uh, you know, not talking about big slack or four locks, you know, in a more normal part of the river, like how, what depth will they generally be? And is it really dependent on the sun this time of year? Um, well, I, I've, I've got a few areas where the depth is going to vary in regards to you know the wintering holes but one some of the stuff that they do have in common is the fact that it's obviously reduced flow and uh it's Im immovable bottom that's not going anywhere and we've had two pretty high water events up here this winter and uh a lot of snow yeah that disappeared really quick and you know we also 
uh, we had a rain up here that lasted for, heck, probably 16 hours, 15, 16 hours of straight rain up here, wow. and it really came up. Um, but I can guarantee you that the areas that I concentrate in the cold water months, that bottom's going to look the same in July when I look at it as it did last November. It, it's that immovable bottom that doesn't go anywhere year after year. Um, and it hasn't. In 17, 18 years, the, those bottoms in those winter areas that I fish hasn't moved. So are you saying that the smallmouth, I could be wrong, are you saying that smallmouth don't move out of their wintering holes? Like, so if if the water goes up by two feet and then back down by two feet in a month's time frame, they still stay in that wintering hole. They're not going to adjust with the flow, generally speaking? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, they've got, they've got that safety there. Um, where they know, I, I'm convinced of it. And again, living on the water and being able to see how they react and what they react to and, um, you know, has helped me immensely over the years. Uh, those fish aren't going anywhere. Uh, uh, they, they found those areas, you know, last fall, right around that diminished daylight time or, you know, photo period change. Uh, when they start consolidating and they're not going to go anywhere. They've got the safety they want. Um, now, of course, you know, and I, I, I've kind of touched on this with some friends of mine and everything, but uh, I think that there are some really good river smally sticks that kind of they struggle a little bit in the cold water period. Um, I've got guys that I know that have been doing this, you, you know, as long as I have for, you know, three or four decades. And, uh, quite honestly, it, they kind of suck in the cold water period. It's not for everyone. You know, it really is. What do you mean? Um, uh, they're, you know, a good day for them might be three or four fish, five fish. And I'm talking December, January, stuff like that, where, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing could take, you know, three or four fish, 20 and up. I don't think they fish to meet the conditions. And a lot of fair weather fishermen, I think, you know, generally fish a little bit too fast in the cold water period. It's a location problem. Um, when, you mean too fa when you mean too fast, I think that's interesting because... I've seen now that they will hit something if it's just drifted above their head, which yeah. in theory is faster than it being on the bottom. So when you mean too fast, I mean, like how, how do we gauge what too fast is just for people listening? Uh, if you're not getting bit, you're probably fishing too fast. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess that, that would do it. Yeah. So more or less like, so if we're talking jerk bait, they're moving the jerk bait too fast. They're, they're throwing a crank bait just off the top of my head, something like that. Or is it that they're moving out of an area too fast? Is it the presentation that's too fast? Or is it them getting out of the spot too fast? Yeah, I think it could be a combination of both, sir. You know, quite honestly, I think, um, it, you know, and I make no bones about it. There, there's not a lot of uh, glory in, you know, dead stick in a hair jig for five minutes. Um, you, you know, where you could take the same same person and give them a crankbait and tell them to crank that ledge over there for the next two hours. And, you know, they're having fun. And, um, I, I think that there are ways in, the, in regards to winter, you know, river smallmouth fishing that have kind of been around forever that work. Um, but I think if fishermen are willing to experiment, I think there's some stuff out there that maybe, you know, um, could up the rods a little bit. Why is it the hair jig? It, I don't even know how to word this. It's so crazy the how revered that stupid little jig is for smallmouth anglers and rivers. What about it do you think makes it so much 
deadlier? Is it just because the hair and how it ebbs and flows in the water? Is it because of the smaller? It's it's very compact. A little bit of a, a little bit of b. Yeah, I think it's the you know, and again, it'll depend on materials. Uh, you know, um, you know, bucktail, bear, you know, coyote. Uh, craft craft hair has been wonderful, and you, you know, in the winter now for over a decade, you know, almost two decades. Um, I, I think that it looks very easy. It, it's an easy meal. Uh, it doesn't overact nature. It looks like stuff that they eat every day. Uh, there are very few negative cues with a hair jig. Um, and I, I just think day in and day out that, uh, it's hard to beat. I mean, it really is. It's been taking River Smalley's now for, you know, since there was lead in hair, you know, put the How, out the hook. When you're talking about keeping that thing locked on the bottom, and I mean by it's like just not moving it, fishing it really slow, it feels like that really suits itself to when you know the river very well and you know you're in the right spot. Yeah. And yeah, which, which is great for veteran anglers, but when you get when you get people that are new to it trying to get out there and fish, I think the interesting conundrum is like if you don't know the spot, you're going to waste so much time, you know, milking it for thirty minutes. So, yeah. in general, how long do you give an area if you're soaking it for you know five to ten minutes per cast? Um, if I'm convinced, and on all of my winter winter holes, I am convinced or I wouldn't be there. Um, I, I have no problem fishing. Like, uh, you know, it might take me four hours to go 50 yards. I and my wife would attest to that. <laughs> that's insane. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and again, that that's just experience. And that's knowing that in past years, and past years, you know, numerous times, um, you know, throughout the year, that's where I caught them, and uh, that's where they return to. And I've got the utmost confidence that I'm fishing around fish. That's what enables me to fish like that. So then if you were going to go to a, a new river, any the James River, New River, this time of year, how long would you give those spots? Or would you just look on a map, pick out a deep hole, and then you're just going to, would you still throw the hair jig or would you start with more moving ish baits to find an area? Uh, how many days do I have to fish it? Weekend, weekend? Friday through Monday? Uh, probably the first day I'm there. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even making a cast. Are you doing any Google map searching or are you just floating yeah. the river? Yeah, both. Yep. Dang. Then what are you doing? I'm going off of everything that I know with whatever I found out that first day. And I would camp on spots that my gut told me that they're stacked in. How long does your gut tell you to stay at that one spot? Uh, do you put a time? A, a, do you put I, a clock on I, it? Until I caught a fish. On these rivers that are not the Susquehanna, you know, the yeah. one of the forks of the Shenandoah, the Upper Potomac, how many on average are are you dealing with a school that stack up in the wintertime or is it just single fish no it's schools it, it's uh I, i've seen uh, I, you know on sunny days i've seen uh fish that uh are in diminished flow but deep water that actually will slide right and left out of that deep water I know, say, three- and four-day warming trends, they'll come up out of that deep water and go to the shallow side or weak side of a river, and they suspend there. They might suspend there in three foot of water. Really? They're 
sitting there baking in the sun, you know, basking in that sun on, on the weak side of the river. As the day progresses, they go back. And again, this is right and left. It's not north and south. And they'll go back into that sanctuary, that deeper water as the day progresses. I've seen easily, I think uh, the most I've ever seen doing that, suspended, uh, 21, 22 fish. And I called a friend of mine the night that I saw it. That's interesting that you bring that up with the how they slide around because we talk about that with largemouth and reservoirs. But yeah. when you're dealing with this, you're talking about, and for you guys that are that are watching and listening, you're talking about an eddy and you have the shallow side and the deep side of the eddy. And so as the sun heats up, they will slide to a foot of water to warm and then yeah. they'll slide back down. Um, yeah. I don't think a lot of anglers truly appreciate that type of movement in the wintertime. Yeah, it, you know, in living on the water definitely has helped a lot of things, and that that's uh, no doubt one of them uh, that I can say. If I hadn't seen it more than once, um, I'd probably think it was, you know, some figment of somebody's imagination, but um, it's really not uncommon if the conditions are right to see that. Um, and a lot of these... Uh, back to your original question, you know, about how many, um, th they're stacked in these holes. I mean, it, it, you know, and quite honestly, some of these fish are resident fish. They'll get on the weak side of the river, uh, out of these wintering holes. They, they'll spawn directly across from, you know, where they spent the winter and they drop back. Depending on the size of the eddy that you're fishing, do you, in the winter time, how worried are you about spooking the fish with a cast? And let's just say you're the same distance away uh, from your target as you were any other time of year. Do you feel like this time of year is more forgiving for a bad cast or will it penalize you more for a bad cast? No, I actually... Um... I, I've told uh, friends of mine that, I, that I, I, I've typed reams of information around topics just like that right there. And that's a great question. Um, I can be three or four or five feet off with the cast and I'm wasting my time. I mean, I really am. They're, they're, they're not going to move north and south for a bait. And if I'm off, I'm off and I'm wasting my time. That's interesting because I think it gets back to some hypothesis that I have um, with winter fishing is when we say fishing fast versus slow, I think it's about you moving a spot. And it's like if you lock down, anchor down, and you fish that spot for an hour, maybe you can move a little faster moving bait, but you're hitting different angles until you find that exact right one. Versus I've seen guys in the summertime, they pull up to an eddy, one cast, and they leave. And I and that to me is like when I was told as a kid, you gotta fish slower, I always thought it was just the presentation. No, it's also like you gotta stay there and you gotta hit as many cast angles as possible until you find the right one. Cause they're not moving. Right. Yeah. I, I uh I've got a lot of uh trip reports. Um, that I used to submit to Ned, um, you know, say on, uh, you know, January 3rd, you know, such and such year, I went out and I did this and here's how I did it and where I went, all that. Those are still on the end fishermen. I think they're, they're I, I, even I still look back on those and a great amount of time in those pieces that I wrote up, I was talking about dividing your cast into a grid. And it's almost like you, you've got eight lanes going this way and you've got eight lanes going this way and you're dividing those casts up into grids. And not just feeding lanes, but actual, like you're hitting those squares. And uh, th that helped me immensely in the river game in the winter. Over the years, it, it really helped. Continuing with this, um, you mentioned, Ned, 
how did you guys, how that become a thing? Um, on his, uh, Midwest finesse site, I commented about one of the baits that he did an article on. There was a little comment section. And I think two days later, he and I were emailing and it was all downhill from there. And I believe what it was, if I'm not mistaken, was a hair jig, old school hair jig, and a 101 pork frog. The old, you know, flying rind, if you will, from back in the day. That's old school. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask every smallmouth guy this question. Tube... Are you team tube or team Ned rig? Um, I think that there is water that a tube gets through better. And I think that there's water that a Ned shines in other than a tube. Why do you think that? Uh, I, with the tube, if you don't have exposed lead, I think it bounces and careens off the bottom better. Mm -hmm. It ricochets off of there. And largely a lot of what I did with the Ned rigs, and I'll just take the cut stick, for example. Um, you know, the original prescription for that was the 16th and 32nd ounce original gophers. And, and um, you know, with size six and four hooks which are minuscule compared to, you know, what guys use now. That's true. Um, and the reason I mention that is I wanted something that would careen off the bottom, much like a tube did. And I, I kind of achieved that by pulling the, at that time, I was pulling a LASTEC over my jig head and the jig head was internal. Hmm. Interesting. And that I was seems saying, like it was a pain in the ass. <laughs> well, yeah, it wasn't too bad. I mean, if I had, you know, sent on the head and some kind of lubrication on the head and stuff, it wasn't too bad. Um, now, before that, I, I was making sure that, you know, that blunt end of a Ned rig stick was a bigger circumference than what my lead was, so I had that cushion. So it was bigger than the actual jig head. You see so many of the Ned heads anymore that sit flush right to that, you know, the back of that. You don't want that. You, you know, it actually helps to have a bigger circumference on, on that than what your lead is. It helps it careen off the bottom and wedge less. That's when I first started this show, I thought that was the dumbest question, but then I realized there are people that are passionately tube and die or Ned rig and die. And it's really hard to find people that will use both. It's so interesting how it is locked into those two camps. Yeah, I use both. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a right answer there, but I mean, the, the shortest answer that I can give is I've got water that I can easily drag a tube through and dead stick it and it's not going to get wedged. And I've got other water where I much prefer a Ned. So it sounds like your decision is not based on which bait is the most match the hatch that time of year. It's based on how you can effectively fish it. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. That is interesting. I have my biggest problem with the Ned rig and I fish it a ton guys. You all know that is finding the perfect head because sometimes those Z man heads, I feel like were created to perfectly get snagged. So you have to just buy more of them. Uh, it's insane how snaggy that mushroom head can actually get. Do you have a certain head type that you like, or do you just stick with that mushroom head? Um, typically how much lead are you using? Depends on the flow rate, sure. honestly. Um, if it's ripping hard, I'll go with a heavier one, but that's a cop-out because I got a Japanese-style jig head I use. 
if I is if it's regular like flow conditions or, or lighter, I'll go with a one thirty sixth to okay. now it's probably one thirty six is really what I'm I'm at generally speaking. I I I have gone up to uh, one eighth before, but the problem with one eighth it has to be those deeper pools where it's like six feet yep. plus. Right. But and then I like to go with where is it? Actually, I want right here. I mean, I like that more that ball style head more than the mushroom because I feel like the head design does affect it, not just the mass on when it hits a rock and how it rolls versus it just anchoring. Right. I do think that the mushroom head will probably let it stand up more, but I also think the mushroom head will also get snagged easier. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, mushroom heads were not made to fish Rocky Rivers. Uh, the, There's a the, shock. <laughs> it, you know, it, um, originally, you know, those gopher mushroom heads where all that came from was fishing weed lines in Minnesota. Uh, deep weed lines with jig, the jig worming technique on deep weed lines in Minnesota. That's and old uh, it, and um, they are not meant to be bottom bouncing in, you know, Eastern rivers. <laughs> That's uh, precisely what they weren't made for. Uh, they were made to shed weeds away from the hook. And that's another reason those hmm. hooks are so small. So it wouldn't get caught up in moss and, you know, lily pads and whatnot on weed lines. Um, they are not the perfect recipe for Eastern rivers. Now, I will say this. I do think that a lot of anglers have kind of likened the cut stick bait to a glorified shaky head and they're mm. married to the bottom with it. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I, I, I had a piece back in the day with Ned where I was very adamant about the fact that I, I very rarely dead stick a net. Right. Um, what I would do is kind of leach the salt out of those baits where they almost nearly suspended. And I was essentially shaking those anywhere four, six, eight inches off the bottom and suspending them right off the bottom is how I fish those for you. And I still do. Yeah. So it's almost like a, um, liken it to taking a Yamamoto Senko weightless and you're casting it out there just to get it to just flow down, downstream. Um, that's, that's brilliant. And, and I had, uh, back in, I can't believe it's December now. I had Jeff Miller and Jeff, uh, Wal Walford on, uh, those guys are two old, old river rats. And they talked about, they use four pound tests like it's no tomorrow. And I thought yeah. that is ballsy, sir, that they do that. Um, and they did it without leader material. Are, are, are you, what is your perfect setup for the tube and the Ned rig? Are you going straight fluorocarbon or mono like old school, or are you using braid to a leader uh it depends on the time of the year it, um and i've also i've got two different rod choices as well that i fish all that stuff on that is dependent on the time of the year if i'm sitting on a river hole in the winter and i'm fishing probably some of the deepest water within you know three five ten miles either way up or down river um, I'm fishing largely much shorter casts, much more precise casts, and I'm fishing deeper, obviously. Um, and I, I, I fish straight fluoro, four pound test. Why? Because, and this is that curiosity, wouldn't braid give you better sensitivity? Not on slack line. Uh, okay. Uh, slack line pickups on braid are nowhere even close to what they are on fluoro hmm. not even close the the bite transmission on that is not even in the same same realm um now in summer um i will i go straight i, I go braid very light braid and uh i, I use jdm line uh, w which is actual brake strength stuff and very thin. Um, 
and I might be using four or five pound braid on a seven and a half foot rod, you know, light rod, and I'm sending it like well out of the spook zone. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, you know, with a high rod tip and I, I'm keeping as much line as I can off the water. So, you know, the, the flow of the water is not affecting my bait because of line. I, I don't want, I don't want my line dragging. That makes sense. That really does make a lot of sense. Um, what size, what, what type of rod are you using? Graphite. Medium light? Medium? Are you going to go to a whippy stick of an ultralight? Um, I would say probably not a traditional light. So it's a custom rod? Um, no, or, it's sold, uh, but... Or is that a state secret? No, it's sold. It's uh, probably one of the most sensitive sticks that I've used. Well, um, wh why is that so important to you? I'm a tackle snob. No, I, I meant... <laughs> I'm um, a high-end tackle snob. <laughs> why, why, why is the... Is that why the rod is the... It sounds like the rod is the most important part of this setup. So uh, I, I, why? I think every, everything combined is important uh, in combination with the line, uh, the lack of lead, um, you know, in uh, casting distance, reel is important. Um, I only use one spinning reel. Um, I, I don't jump around and use all kinds of stuff. I, I know the intimate feel of one reel, and that's why I use it. But since the rod is such a a important piece, because that's why it's it's a guarded secret, which is fine for the show. Is it because <laughs> of is it because of the sensitivity though that gains it? Because I know a lot of my river rats I've had on through the years, they all most of them get a custom rod built for sensitivity purposes, and to be able to maximize distance. And based on what they've told me, is that kind of the same thing? It's it's castability, sensitivity, and distance you can get really are the things that the right rod would give you. Yeah, I think how I I think how certain tapers of rod will load the loading, okay, and will launch a small light bait. Uh, you know, it, and it took me years to arrive at what works for me on the light tackle side. Um, yeah, it, it's. I'm glad that you said that because that's something I've been experimenting with. I got a couple. I got a couple of guys helping me out. They're custom rod builders about finding that perfect setup now because it is about. It can't be so thick that you tear those tiny hooks out, but it's got to have an. I, I tried last year. I tried to use an ultralight. I have this nice crappie rod. It's a seven and a half foot ultralight. That sucker sucked because that thing had no backbone right. at all. I could cast right. that sucker about seven miles. It's great, but. There right. was, it was like a wet sponge when you set the hook. It, it, it is. It's so important to find that setup with yep. the hook size. Cause if that hook is too thick, you're not going to get it in there. If it's too thin and the rod's too heavy, you're going to bend out the hook. You're not going to get any puncture. Right. It, it, it's, I think with this stuff compared to super heavy tackle, it's more of a fine science. I feel like I could yeah. be wrong in comment section. You can tell me when this thing gets uploaded you can be off a little bit on your punching setup and you're still going to hit pay dirt versus if you're off with your finesse setup, you're screwed. It's not going to work. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, casting distance most certainly, but also being able to uh, protect light line. Mm. Um, That's a good point. And uh, I use a, a couple rods on the finesse side that I, I don't think that, most people would believe it until they went fishing with me. Have you seen the rise of this BFS stuff, the bait caster finesse systems? And if you have, do you have any opinions on it? Um, I actually, I can still cast further with a spin, uh, spinning rod. And, and I'm talking like, say, uh, you know, take your pick out of the mega bass BFS lures, which I'm a fan of. Those I'll things are cool. Right 
Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not affiliated with Mega Bass whatsoever, but I will tell you that the, the, that BFS uh, lineup for Mega Bass is brutal. It's, I mean, it it's, really is. It, it's really good. I, I mean, I would uh, add the uh, Karashi in there, and I would add the Cicada in there. That's good. And the TRD micro stuff, I would I would personally throw that in there. I like the micro stuff they have available now. Um, the thing that I just like about the BFS is when you're dealing with straight fluorocarbon or monofilament, you're not going to have the same issues with managing right. it um, and stopping. If you're will, fishing... Right. If you're fishing yeah. underhangs of trees and stuff, it's so much easier to like just roll cast and thumb and break it versus. So I think if you're trying to be precise, I think BFS has that ability to just very yeah. easily touch it. But you're right, 100 casting distance wise, yes, yeah, spinning spinning stuff all the way, all the way. The the one thing that I really do like about the BFS stuff in in. I was in, I, I was into that stuff long before it was available here. Oh, cool! I mean, I, I mean, going all the way back before, you know, Mega Bass rods were available here, all that stuff. I was importing all that stuff back in the day. Um, you know, the short little, the, you know, six foot three BFS rods and stuff like that, and everything. Um, I'm no stranger to that stuff. Now, where I will say that it plays in my game now is if I'm twitching a bait um, where on spinning tackle, I could be putting slack on the spool. Ah. If I'm, if I'm casting up and across river at precise angles and I'm coming down river toward me and there's slack that can build up on my spool even with four or five six pound jdm line where that's not keeping up with the rate of that lure you can end up with line trouble mm -hmm. i alleviate that with vfs that's, so anything yeah. that i i'm imparting action into a top water um, you know, uh, the small, the small BFS mega bass jerk baits, any of that stuff that's on BFS. Yeah. It, it's something in my game. I really want to keep evolving. Cause I think that stuff, even into the bass fishing tournament world, I think the reason that has not had caught on like glide baits and stuff like that is because no one's won on it. Allegedly. Uh, I think, when a Milliken wins on BFS stuff, that will get such mainstream popularity, which I guess the bonus is we're going to get more BFS style baits for smallmouth fishing rivers. Um, I think it's stupid right. how hard it was to get little jerk baits. You had to go to trout fishing brands to get those little jerk baits. And now, thank right. God, you got Mega Bass pulling out some high quality stuff, just as an example of those micro jerk baits. Yeah, that, that's a terrific uh, assertion there. Um, just today, I was emailing a couple of friends of mine, and there was so much trickle-down effect Yeah. Yep. Uh, into the finesse world that came because of Ned Rig fishing yes. that we, we never would have seen if it hadn't have been for that stupid little cut stick on a mushroom. Uh you know, I, I about got laughed off of riversmallies.com back in the day when I, I was posting a lot of information on that. Guys, guys, they didn't think it was needed. They they thought it was a joke. And, you know, now just about everybody and their brother throws a net. Now, the trickle down in the industry with the lighter jig heads, the smaller, you know, finesse plastics, the finesse rods, yeah. all that stuff because of that. And like you touched on beautifully, and it's exactly what I told my two friends today, BFS is having a trickle down, not just because of BF, BFS tackle. Our lines are getting more refined. Yes. Our treble hook baits are across the line just better. so much more better. advanced yeah. you, you know than uh the old you know number seven rapala days i mean yep. you know all of this stuff is having a trickle down and for those of us that are largely finesse people 
um, it, it's been, uh, you know, actual, absolutely wonderful seeing this stuff. You know, back in the day, it was a hair jig. It was a man stingray grub or a Mr. Twister. Yeah. And you touched on the jig heads now. Like I have friends that talked about you. You didn't have very many options that came to heads or you had to get them custom made. And now right. I can go on like JDM.com and I can buy four or five different you know, BFS jig heads to try for a Ned rig or a tube that you can't get Like there's so many more options to experiment and the hooks are so deadly sticky and sharp. Yeah. They really freaking good hooks. Yeah. Yeah. And they're so much easier to, uh, you know, the fish set themselves largely yeah. and, uh, being able to set those needle point hooks from a distance on light tackle is just phenomenal. Do you think, do you actually hunt over there at all from Japanese sites or anything like that? I, I've gotten addicted to that to see kind of what's coming next down the pipe. And it could be bass fishing or just, they're big over trout fishing over there. Some of their trout jerk baits are just badass looking. Yeah, a lot of the JDM companies um, are actually going to the trout side even more and more because their bass fishing is so miserable. <laughs> over there, it, you know, and it is, uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, largely thought of as, you know, bass companies over there that, uh, they're making some pretty darn good trout stuff that equates over to the, you know, the BF BFS side. Mm -hmm. Now to answer your question about like back in the day, I used to scour that stuff. I was looking at yen rates and, you know, the U.S. dollar conversion all the time back in the day. That's so cool. Before, none of that stuff was available here. Mm. You know, absolutely none of it. And I'm going like back to the original Jackal stuff and dude, oh. old school stuff. Uh, uh, there was nowhere to buy that stuff here. And I'm talking, you know, 98, 99. It just, it wasn't here. It, it's been such a, it's so cool how fast this industry has kind of taken off when for some reason it catches the craving of it's going to be glide baits. We're going to get 10,000 variations. Now we're in the BFS Renaissance. Yeah. And again, you know, not to be a dead horse, but it's really helped us river anglers out. Um, yeah. I did, I did really want to touch on just kind of like where you see the, the, the industry right now, kayaking as a whole, um, where do you feel like it? Do you think it's in a good place? Do you think it's, we are hitting a bubble? That might be another show, but <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I I try to stay in my lane as much as possible, and very political, politically correct um, answer. You know, I really do because you know the decisions that somebody else makes or whatever route. If they're you know if they're having fun in this thing, I, you know, go for it. You know, I, if somebody is, well, old school where, you know, if you got a motor on your kayak, that's not real kayak. I, I don't buy any of that stuff. You know, I, are there people you, saying that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I hear that. Um, you know, it, and uh, being on a pro staff with a kayak company. And it's the same the same kayak company I've been with since day one. Who are they? Um, I don't think we plugged them yet. Jackson. Jackson. Yes, sir. And um, I keep an eye on the industry. I, I, I've got a pretty good pulse on what's going on in the tackle industry, kayaking, and this and that. I, um, I'll be the first to tell you that I, I mean, I, I really don't see the allure of, uh, you know, going to Lake Fork and being a kayak angler. I agree with that. I, I and I, and they're always going to say, it's like, well, that's where everyone wants to go. But, and this is, this is what's hard. You know, I sponsor a couple of kayak organizations. I do have a kayak now, but I have a bass boat and it's paid off. And unless it blows up, I'm not going to sell it. And if I go to the title Potomac, I could try to go out in a kayak or I could enjoy myself and go out in a bass boat. I mean, you sure. know, if I'm, if I'm going to go to Lake Erie, I'm probably going to go out in my bass boat, not the kayak. I mean, there's a place for both of them. There's a place for both of them in the industry. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, there's a reason that I have, uh, 
you know, two, two kayaks and one's for big water and one's for, you know, trickles. And, and um, one boat doesn't do everything. Correct. You know, quite honestly, if, if you're getting around at all, it, you know, you're going to want more than one craft. Mm. Uh, um, you know, and again, it gets back to people make their own decisions. I'm not going to, you know, cast any shade on, you know, this group over here is not doing it the way that I, it, who cares? You know, if people are having fun and they're, they're not breaking any laws and they're staying safe, uh, you know, Godspeed and have fun with it. Do your thing, you know? What do you think about the fishing on the upper Potomac and just in this area, generally speaking? I mean, you've been here for a while now. You've seen, I don't know if you were here at the Shenandoah when the Shenandoah went through its major, you know, death spirals, but yeah. Do you think the fishing is on the uptick? Do you think it's just, they don't, it's not like it used to be or like, where do you think it is? Um, I think that probably portions of the Potomac that don't get mentioned are very, very good. Any fish kills or anything like that over the past 10 years? No, no, sir. No. And I, I continuously see our fish getting bigger, um, you know, and like we, uh, like we touched on, I mean, uh, you know, prior to taping, uh, just briefly that, I mean, I set goal. I, I think as anglers, we have to set goals going into the new season and, um, you know, for ourselves and, you know, every year I try to do that with my, some years I, I double it and other, other years, you know, I fail miserably. That's, um, I, I don't have too much trouble with citation fish. Um, you know, where I fish, um, I've found myself probably in the last five to six years, I target, you know, most people would be content with 20, 20 inches a year out of, you know, the waters that I fish and stuff like that. But I, um, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I want to break seven pounds. That's a great little segue to the next question I had for you. Do you think the Potomac river, could it break a state record and that's going to be hard because I think the Maryland record is like eight pounds, nine pounds. And I think the West Virginia record is the new river, which was like nine pounds, I think, allegedly. No. Uh, West Virginia record was actually set within a stone's throw of my house. And it was nine, two, nine, two. Yep. Out of Romney. Do you think it could be broken? No. Why? I, I, I think that that was in a time uh, before man got his grips on that river. Hmm. Uh, and there was some uh, commercial farming that probably didn't do do any help to that portion of the uh, the South Branch. West, West Virginia state record came out of the South Branch, right in Romney. I think, and then guys, I have it up here. So yeah, 1971 South Branch, uh, 975 David Lindsay, and then yep. 1976, there was another nice one caught that was 7.5 pounds from the New River. My hypothesis on this, since I've been having so many people on the show talking about it, I think the reason you'll never see state records broken is because, and this is the through line I've seen, when it's always the 70s and the late in the early 80s, it's the fact that back then you didn't do catch and release. You were calling. And I think what that did is I think the fishing back then, you had a situation where there was not as many. And so the ones that did survive, they could actually grow and prosper. And you see this a lot if you watch hunting shows when they talk about building a good 10-point buck. You can't have a lot of herd. Yeah. I think you're going to probably catch more five-pounders, but it's also meaning that there's a really hard chance to grow that 110. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's absolutely spot on. I, I think uh, you know, two or three decades ago, a lot of the gene pool got killed. Yeah. 
uh, you, you know, for uh, for the glory of taking a Polaroid. Yep. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's, it's just interesting. It's always like, like 1976, 1971, like 82. This is when all the big records for smallmouth and largemouth were really taken. Right. And it's just really, when you think about when Forrest Wood had the first Bassmaster Classic that was catch and release, it, it's just, there has to be a through line there of like, when we stopped taking bass, then the state records started to disappear. We didn't get any more. It's just so fascinating how maybe there was a negative to catch and release. Yeah, I, I you know, and I've heard, uh, I've heard swim bait anglers, you know, out West talk about that. Uh, you know, some of the old uh, Southern California swim baiters talk about educating their fish and uh, disruption of the gene pool and everything with, you know, a lot of those records um, out West, uh, a lot of those, you know, lake records, uh, they went home. You yeah. know, they, they didn't swim away. Uh, um, I know one lake in particular when I was stationed out in California, If I mean, just it, almost every six months was producing a new uh, state record spotted bass. And that's, uh, you know, Lake Paris mm. out there in California. And, you know, seven and eight pound spotted bass and, uh, and all this stuff. And it was broke numerous times. And then, you know, the bottom falls out of that fishery and people wonder, you know, where are all the big spotted bass? Well, you know, you just took, you know, three generations of them out of the lake. Um, and I think rivers are a lot of, uh, very similar to that. Um, you know, you, you know, as well as I do, how old, you know, a six pound river fish is. And, uh, do you ever think that some of these older records are not actually true? Because so many of these records are like, it's a 10 and a half pound smallmouth, but we have no photos. Just believe us. Like, it's so weird how many, like when you go through the archives of state by state, there's so few of these old records that have a Polaroid or something to verify the size. It's just a measurement on a website. And I don't know a nine pound smallmouth. That's, that's Lake Erie size. That's insane. And it like, and I know there was one caught out of, um, no, not Lock Raven. Maybe it's Liberty Reservoir, Maryland. No picture. Yeah. And it's like, there's yeah. no way in hell it's a 10 pounder. I need a photo. Otherwise, you need to start putting asterisks by these records when it's like, this was caught in the 1930s to verify it. Cause I don't know. It's just some of these things just seem too outlandish to be like that kind of size. Nine, nine, two. That's insane. That is a freaking beast. That, uh, you know, and you, you figure. That was also taken at a time that Billy Westmoreland was taking eight, nine pounders out of Dale Hollow. And right here out of uh, less than a uh, cast wide portion of river is where that nine, two was taken. Um, That's so hard to believe though. I don't know why it's just, okay. Dale Hollow though. You're talking about a reservoir of the forage, absolutely. everything. And uh, you know, and I guess that's my point is, uh, you know, Dale Hollow compared to essentially, you, you know, a ditch. <laughs> um, it, it absolutely unbelievable that a nine two came out of where I know it was caught. I, I I've got a guy that comes into my work uh, that is friends with Mister Lindsay, and uh, I I know where that fish was caught, and uh, it's largely it's changed a lot over the years due to, you know, erosion and siltation. And um, to think that a 9-2 came out of that, it'll keep you up at night thinking about it. No, it it, it, it keeps me up at night thinking about these rivers now because I feel like the Upper Potomac is, based on what the DWR has said, and, you know, as people know, I'm on the Black Bass Survivors Board and I'm talking to them all the time, the river's hitting its heyday here soon with how much stocking and stuff. And maybe it's not your section, but the main stem down by Harper's Ferry, it's pumping out great bags. And the fact is, and this is where my brain is like, this is where it's hard for my brain to get around. Even with all the work we're doing, we still can't touch those weights back in the 70s, which is amazing. With sure. all the conservation efforts we have now and people not killing them and all this other stuff, and we still can't touch nine pounds. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I... I've got some theories about that South Branch fish 
Let's that, hear them. Uh, if anyone knows that area, knows that for decades upon decades, there were trout that were pumped into those feeders above that. That would do years. it. <laughs> Um, and if anyone is, uh, familiar with that area, they also know that there's some water in there that's, you're talking 22 to 25 foot deep. Just saying. It, is it, is it a coincidence that almost every big bass, whether it's small mouth, large mouth spot, you're talking kokanee or you're talking trout, you're talking sand. It's just insane yeah. for all big three. Somehow trout is in the equation. Sure. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Um, that reservoir that you mentioned a moment ago, I remember, uh, heck, I remember uh, Jeff Little and I talking about that uh, back in the day because he wanted to go fish it with a, uh, you know, before a rigs were a thing. I, I remember him talking about that reservoir distinctly because the name's a little, you know, odd. And, uh, um, you know, and I, I'm talking, heck, 98, 99, I think he and I <laughs> emailed wow. about that because he knew that I did a lot of lakes, lake, you know, smallmouth fishing at that time on big lakes, and he was kind of picking my brain on that. And the only reason I bring that up is there's a trout connection there. Yeah. Um, you know, look at the gobies, the kokanees, the rainbow trout. It, it's almost these artificial fisheries over the years. Hmm. Uh, the one, uh, you know, just a couple things that I can say that's helped me is you want to go where not many people are going to go that's almost largely inaccessible and you want to probably you can't catch them being on the couch do you think we'll see a 12 pound smallmouth broken on the goby chain up there at the great lakes do you think it's feasible oh i think i, I think there's world records probably in ontario um so the, I guess my question is, you think they can actually get that size past 10 pounds? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, you know, just this past year, there was a 10 taken out of there. Um, now, the one thing that I would say is if I were an angler, a uh, trophy smallmouth fisherman that, you know, was retired and was going to pursue fish of that, the, of that you know, caliber – um, and yes, I am retiring soon. So, maybe <laughs> so, uh, uh, do you want to go after a fish like that in the Atlantic ocean or do you want to, you know, go after it in a pond? And what I mean by that is if I'm going trophy buck hunting, do I want to be in Yosemite yeah. or on an Island? Yeah. Um, I quite honestly, um, I'd be headed to Idaho. There's so many places in that Northeast play. That, yeah. No, wait, Northwest. Sorry, guys. Dyslexic moment. It's insane because I know Montana has a couple of fisheries too. Uh, Oregon has a couple of fisheries. The Dakotas have a couple of fisheries. It's just that whole belt. And it's so funny how this happens where all of a sudden people realize that there's bass there. It's like it, they didn't just appear there. They've been there forever. And part of it, I think the secret got out. But I think the other part of it is forward facing sonar and people could figure out how to catch them. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, no doubt. No, no doubt. Uh, you, you know, you've got these massive fish that are, you know, uh, they're in uh, pods of two and three and they're out meandering in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, that that's a tremendous tool. You know, of course, it takes a hit because everyone gets tired of looking at the back of people's heads on Saturday and Sundays at tournaments. But if they look at it as a learning tool as to so much of what has been written about in the last four or five decades about bass is becoming. Oh my God. It's so amazing. It, 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 it 
if people looked at it more along those lines, um, you know, maybe they could sleep at night a little easier than getting all riled up. But no, the, the scientific research that you could write on just fish behavior has changed so much from when Al Linder made his like, you know, the large on the small mouth Bible. It's an it's sure. It's insane. And I keep saying like the, the learning I've gotten as an angler just from watching and figuring out the behavior and what they do and how they act at different size levels. Like that's the other thing I realized, like yep. a five pounder acts differently swimming around there than a two pounder. And you can almost see the personality on a fish. And it's just, I never thought my wildest dreams you'd have that happen where you could just watch that in real time. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's it's one thing uh, where we're at right now, but I, I most certainly I, I'd be lying to you if I uh, if I said that I wonder where you know what we're looking at in five ten years. I think unless they put restrictions on it, it's just going to keep getting more refined and better. I think what's interesting is to see how we consider these fish dumb and how fast they get educated to it. Um, you shine sure. that you you shine that cancer beam at them now, they know they just do. Uh, I think the older fish do know what that beam is. Uh, I think the the younger ones don't. But I think that's the same thing with deer hunting. You know the, the the ten pointer just it's got that sixth sense about it, and it knows when it hears that click and what's going on. Right. So I think we're just going to reeducate them even more, and I think they're going to start going in shallow. I think they're going to start. We chase them, so they are going to set. The premise they're going to set the 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 conditions for war so to speak and so they're going to start realizing in a couple of generations that we can't just be out in the ether anymore we have to change our behavior again yeah you know mother nature is very resilient yep yep and uh you know we've all seen uh those of us that have done you know the river thing for any length of time we we saw the decimation that the uh, 2018 floods did and uh you know i i really felt the effects of 2018. yeah uh i i can tell you right now it took about three years to kind of put that in a rear view where things got back to you know, where, where it could and should be. Um, 2018 was uh, it, horrible. I mean, it really was. The, the floods we got, the, the high water events at the worst time of year too, the worst time of year to have those high water events. Um, and I think I've beaten this to at, like a dead horse about the Shenandoah, but that place couldn't catch a break. Not only did you have the fish kills, but then you had those massive flood. And it just, that place was just, there's nothing left. It was decimated, completely yeah. decimated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the vegetation, like that's the thing I saw this year, at least in the Hancock area and down is like you get grass again, you start to see bluegill that were or sunfish that were decimated by the flathead. Now you're starting to see them come back because of the vegetation and hopefully they'll get a good spawn in if we don't have another blowout. So I don't know. Do you feel that uh, that's a forage base for your bigger smallmouth? The sunfish? Yeah. I think that they're, I feel like it's too early to tell because they, based on what people have told me, the sunfish in this area from Hancock down have not been in here thick lately because of the flathead. Sure. I, I think if the sunfish start getting up in population again, I think they will because I've caught four or five smallmouth on a swim jig. Um, when I was trying to target some largemouth in that section and it had chartreuse tip tails, that son of a bitch did not look like a minnow or crayfish. It was a bluegill imitation and they, and they swallowed it. So either they're opportunistic, which it could possibly be that, but I, I don't see why a smallmouth wouldn't. Cause I've seen smallmouth up at Lake Champlain and Cayuga eat perch and bluegill. So oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. They don't have the shiner that the Susky has, like the big shiner. And I feel like if you're a bigger smallmouth, you're either hunting crayfish or you're going after mad toms or sunfish because there's maybe occasional sucker, but what else is there to pick from? Right. Yeah, I, I totally concur. Now, I will tell you that uh, the general 
area that I fish is loaded with bluegill and green sunfish. Loaded. To the point of... And, it, it, you know, I go back on, back and forth on this when I converse with friends of mine. But, uh, you know, elephants eat peanuts when it comes to the finesse game. But I, I, I'll tell you, when there's a pack of 10 big bluegill chasing your bait, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a deterrent to a big smallmouth. Yeah, it... <sighs> I feel like it's also seasonal. I really think that's seasonal. Um, I think all fish are that way. I think that's when you saw Brood X, how so many predatory fish, they switched when Brood X of the cicada came in and they started to key in on them. I think the bluegill pattern works at specific times when they can ambush them or when it's their beds. If I had to hypothesize, um, the smallmouth I caught with the bluegill imitation was around grass, grass patches. And so... I wonder if that's because they can ambush something like that compared to if it's just gin clear and they can see them, are they an effective predator? And, I, and in general, I've, and you guys know, I've done like an hour seminar on that with largemouth. Bluegill just have a different relationship with bass compared to shad and minnows. It's such a weird yeah. thing where they live with them almost, but then you just got to do something to make, make it go from this, symbiotic relationship to a, a predator prey relationship immediately and it's just so weird the you have to do something if you're imitating a bluegill to trigger that this bait is afraid of the bass to make the cat and mouse game start if you don't do that the bass just thinks it's just a regular blue there's nothing wrong with it, 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 it i don't know it's, it's a it's the weirdest relationship i think in the the fish kingdom because a shad there's one thing that that bass knows i can kill that thing anytime minnow crayfish all that but a bluegill it's such a weird thing that you can have 50 bluegills swimming around and your kid catches one bluegill and that one bluegill that's on the end of the line will tell that bass immediately i'm gonna go kill that one i, I i'm always yeah. so fascinated by that relationship yeah it's uh you, you touched on uh one piece there that if uh that, that i've reiterated before that uh I can tell you right now that uh, big smallmouth have a uh, a definite kill thought when it comes to when uh, those fish are on the beds. Oh yeah, uh, pretty much right behind the house down here on any given evening during you know bluegill or green sunfish spawn, you're going to see shark like behavior in about a foot of water or less. It it's it's incredible like they can key in on that at, at yeah. yeah it's so incredible travis yeah. uh, it, you know and i'm a really big proponent of uh you know keeping up with whatever they're reading uh throughout the season I, i've definitely seen some patterns you, you know throughout the years and uh every fish that i catch i'm looking in their mouth i'm looking for something to go flying off the hook you know, when they do all this stuff and they're shaking and stuff, and I want to know what they're what they're keyed in on, and uh, um, that helps tremendously. I mean, it really does. The last thing I wanted to bring up is, and I got it was like two or three ups shows ago. I, I it's a blur when you talked about the hegar mites because that's a big bait that people. Everyone says they fish it, but I have never had somebody in my boat or kayaking with me that that just wailed on them with a, with a Helgramite. Is that shit work? Like I, I see people catch them, but it's like, is it a seasonal thing? Is it, is that the deal with it? Cause I, I, I must work. Yeah, it does work. Um, I, I think that the best times for that, um, because a lot of the imitators of that, uh, you know, natural forage, they've got the appendages and they're, they're a pretty active bait. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't go out in January and dead stick one of them things, and, it, you know, it looks opportunistic, but um, I'll put it this way. Uh, you know, Russ Snyder up on the Susquehanna last year during that tournament, he, he ran living rubber through a bang stick. Hmm. 
And, uh, you know, quite honestly, it looked like a poor man's Helga mind. Hmm. Um, I think that there are certain times of the year where your appendages and flappers and this and that and the other, I think, are, it, you know, there, there's something to be said for that. But, I, you know, um, a lot of the old timers split shot rigging a, you know, Helga Mike. Now, living up in New York, I never, I couldn't even have told you what a Helga Mike was. Down here, you know, it should be on some kind of uh, state flag somewhere or something. You know, like everybody, you know, like Helga Mike, you know. I know. And I feel like being a younger guy, I missed the boat on that because everyone talks about it. And it's like, I, I don't, I don't understand the seasonal thing there with it. Um, to yeah, be that, honest, that and the mad Tom thing is like really big down here. I mean, the mad, really yeah, the, the mad Tom thing is, is huge. No one talks about the mad Tom. It feels like the Helgramite mic <laughs> got slipped out and the, the mad Tom people do not like to talk about, but again, I think it's the same profile. And I think that's why it's so interesting with color where, you can throw black in gin clear water or, or a darker color than Bassmaster would tell you to throw, but it's because you're matching that body profile of, uh, I think, a Helgramite or a Mad Tom or something that has that darker coloration against the bottom. Um, yeah, I think there's really something to be said for that, uh, you know, that Mad Tom or, uh, you know, that bottom dwelling uh, creature. You know, it, I, I just that sculpting Mad Tom looking profile is yeah. Uh, I think in about ninety seven or ninety eight, and you might remember this because he was kind of a he had a big name here locally. Um, but Charlie Case that owned uh, Case Plastics back in the day made made a Mad Tom, and I fished the absolute bejesus out of that up in New York uh, on the Susquehanna feeders. And that, that thing got drilled. Hmm. I mean, it's absolutely drilled up there. Walleye, pike, uh, it didn't matter. Uh, that thing got crushed. And it was that profile with those peck fins on it. Uh, you know, that fat head and the peck fins. It, it, it just, get, there was something to it. Um, and then, you know, coming down here, I, I see what smallmouth down here have in their throats. And uh, it's a player. I mean, it is. It, it, it really is. Travis, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Um, pl it, please, you know, promote all your, your sponsors. And if people want to find you, where can they follow you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook. And uh, quite honestly, I only got on there about a year ago to appease some of my sponsors and let them know that I'm not uh, completely 100% uh, a hermit that lives in the woods. Um, and uh, also, you know, given what I do for my day job, I, I stay pretty low and just do kind of do my own thing up here in the woods and all I do is fish. But uh, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, first and foremost, thanks for having me, sir. I appreciate it. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, I'll be seeing you soon here uh, mm -hmm. at a show. <laughs> um, you know, Jackson Kayak, uh, Sims, Daiwa, Reels, uh, you know, Yamamoto, Procure, Smith Optics. Uh, they've all been huge for me, and I, I couldn't thank them enough. Um, I do have something new um, coming. I've got to sign a contract tomorrow. Um with a rod company. That's why I didn't answer your question earlier. <laughs> um, well, this thing will be uploaded in about a week and a half, at least, or two weeks from the date of recording. So we will be in the clear there. Uh, I would like to uh, also add Phoenix rods there. Hey, my boy. That's all I throw. It's Phoenix rods. And uh, Verifast. Uh, the JDM line that I touched on earlier was Verifast. That's freaking awesome. All right. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Uh, please leave some comments. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Again, check us out on Patreon. We're only 15 away from hitting our first goal. After that point, we're going to be heading towards our goal of starting a nonprofit to help supplement any stock and help improve the waterways around you know this area that we call home. See you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV. 
with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.